morning's scripture reading will be taken from John 1, 9 through 11. John chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. We are genuinely glad that you are here to worship God this morning. I invite you to keep your Bibles open to the Gospel of John, and we'll flip around a few pages from there. We'll note first that the book of John opens with a word about the Word, who was God, who came in the beginning, was in the beginning, and then came later on in the flesh in order to save us from our sins. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. I believe in a created world. I believe that there was a divine mind behind all of the design that we see. The Bible goes on then in the Gospel of John to tell us a little bit more about what it was like when Jesus entered the world. In verse 4 it says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. There are two concepts that people like generally, aren't there? Life, we don't like the opposite of that too much. And light, we don't like the opposite of that too much, except for when we're trying to sleep. We like life and we like light. And in Jesus, there was both. But verse 5 tells us, sadly, that the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. I'm not sure how to describe that in any different language than what the Bible has already said. And I shouldn't try, I suppose, to some degree, because the Bible always says it better. There are things that I don't comprehend. Somebody might try to explain to me meteorology. Somebody might try to explain to me physics, and I'm going to have trouble comprehending that. Here, the light, which always stands for good and righteousness and truth in the Scriptures, comes into the darkness, and the darkness doesn't get it. The darkness doesn't understand. Well, the passage goes on to tell us that there was a forerunner of Christ, John the Baptist, who came to get the Jewish people ready. They had been waiting for a Messiah for quite some time. It was always prophesied that there would be somebody who came before the Messiah to rouse up the people, stir them, cause them to repent. And that person turned out to be John the Baptist. So verse 6 says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He wanted to get people ready to believe in Jesus. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. John wasn't the light, but he came to tell about Jesus that was coming afterwards. That was the true light, Jesus, which gives light to every man come, who comes into the world. Three uses of the word world in verse 10. He, that's Jesus, was in the world, that world that he made. The world with all the people on it. The world with humanity and all the animals and the vegetation and the seas and the skies. He was in the world. And the world was made through him. He did all that. He was responsible for it. And then the world did not know him. Well, there are different connotations to the word world in those passages. When it says the world does not know him, it's talking specifically about humanity. Psalm 148 gives us an idea about how the sun and the moon and the stars always do what God says. The animals always do what they've been programmed to do. But mankind has free will and we can reject the instructions that God has given us. The world did not know him. Furthermore, verse 11 says, he came to his own. That would mean his own people. And that would be more than just his hometown. Although Jesus would say on occasion, a, man, a, a prophet has no honor except in his own country. A prophet is not without honor except in his own country. But it would mean his particular people. Because in this particular situation, Jesus was brought forth from the nation of the Jews. And the nation of the Jews had been specifically formulated to bring forth Jesus. That was their purpose. That was the whole thing. That was the whole reason for them. God brought Abraham into the world. 
God told Abraham to start a nation, made him wait 25 years as a test of faith for his firstborn son to come. He had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, Jacob had the 12 tribes, the 12 tribes sinned in the face of God's instructions. But God still worked through them to bring Christ through the tribe of Judah and the lineage of David and into the world to be the Savior for all mankind, as has always been prophesied. And you would think that the Jews would have known who Jesus was because he was prophesied so much in the Old Testament. You would think that that poor nation would have known that this was the one that they were expecting. But he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. That's such a tragic statement. David Leip, in his commentary on the Gospel of John, gives some points as to why his own nation would not receive him. He has a great commentary. We always look to the scriptures first. But he gives some ideas here, and I've adapted them a little bit, to point us to the places in scripture that give us reasons that the people of Jesus, his own nation, rejected him. And then maybe if we can see some reasons they rejected him, we might understand a little bit more about why our nation, why our people, why our world, why our neighbors reject him. First of all, the first reason you might say, you might phrase it in different ways. The world rejected Jesus because they were simply stubborn, recalcitrant. They're not willing to change. They're going to hold to their own ways no matter what. And that statement is a reflection of what Jesus says in John chapter 3 verses 19 through 21 what the word of God says in John 3 verses 19 through 21 it's talking about the light again it's talking about Jesus this is after Jesus has had a conversation with Nicodemus about being born again told him about how the spirit would help those people that who obeyed God and now it says this and this is the condemnation this is the judgment this is the condemnation this is what condemns people that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. I can't imagine getting up in the morning and somebody saying, well, what do you choose today, Andy? Would you like to go through the world blind or seeing? I think we'd all choose to be seeing. What would you choose today, Andy, that we leave all lights off, that the sun does not shine, or that you have light? I think we'd all choose light. Spiritually speaking, though, a great majority of the world chooses, does not have it inflicted upon them, but chooses the darkness. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. The word of God would shine a light upon the behavior of, of some people they don't want that light so they're not going to be anywhere where they're exposed to scriptural teaching and they're not going to be anywhere where they're exposed to Jesus no matter how much he genuinely loves them and wants what's best for them light gives you what's best for you light shows you the way but the darkness trips you up and the darkness brings evil and the darkness brings pain Jesus says that the reason more people don't come to him is because they simply would rather suffer self-inflicted misery while they're being deceived into it, enjoying the passing pleasures of sin. I'll give you two examples of that from Scripture. One is the idea of self-destruction. People engage in self-destructive behavior simply because they like it temporarily, but they don't realize the long-term effects it's going to have on them. People engage in self-destructive behavior because they don't realize or they've been led to, re to, they've been taught that Jesus doesn't care for them, just wants to hate them, just has no good for them, and so they think that their ways are better. People engage in self-destructive behavior when they don't simply trust Jesus that if you behave this way, it'll work out better in the end. Here's just one example if you'd like to turn to the 23rd chapter of the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is wisdom literature. Proverbs is poetry. And in poetry, we have a figures of speech here that will tell us how some people, in just one instance of life, bring self-destruction 
rather than listen to the words of what God has said. Verse 29 starts to speak about the drunk. It says, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who's, who's bringing real sorrow on himself? Who complains all the time? Who has wounds and he doesn't know why the wounds are there? Who has redness of eyes? The next phrase says. And the answer starts in verse 30. Those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed wine. They want some sort of temporary escape from the world, but they don't realize the long-term harm it's going to do to them. Do not look, then, the wise writer says on verse 31, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. Oh, it's going to bring you in. But remember from John 8 verse 44 that the devil is a liar and the father of lies. So this looking good and the things that it promises is all a lie. At the last, verse 32, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. And here's what will happen. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. You're going to have delusions. You're going to think things are going on that aren't going on. And then you're going to start speaking things that are out of your head and things for which you'll be held accountable later that you wonder and you don't even remember saying. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one. Here's a simile. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Who's going to lie down in the midst of the sea? You'll sink. You won't live. But you won't have any judgment to you. That's what the alcohol does to your mind or the drugs or whatever other kind of substance that alters your reasonable thinking. And then it says, or like one who lies at the top of the mast. He goes to the ship and goes to the very top not realizing that he might fall off with the slightest swaying of the boat. He lies at the top of the mast, and here's what he says to himself. They've struck me, but I was not hurt. They may have, hurt, they may have struck me, but I didn't feel it because I was all hyped up on the alcohol. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. And then, before he can realize all the pain that's come to him, because of those beatings, before he can realize the unreasonableness of his behavior and how it's going to harm him and other people, he says to himself, when shall I awake that I may seek another drink? There are people who love the darkness and don't want to come to the light. The instructions of the Bible are light. They're goodness. They're from the love of the Savior's heart. But he realizes that most people aren't going to follow him. People will destroy themselves because they love the darkness rather than the light. And then societies will destroy themselves because they love the darkness rather than the light. Just one passage, Jeremiah chapter 25, starting at verse 4. Before we get into it, remember the history of Israel. God said to them in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, I've given you my words. If you keep my words, you'll live by them. You'll possess this land for a long time. You'll have, a good, you'll have good rains from heaven. You'll have good crops. He's saying this to ancient Israel. You'll have every kind of blessing that you could possibly have. But if you don't keep these words, and if you go off to the idols and the immorality, then you're going to be kicked out of the land. And you're going to have all kinds of suffering. God warned them. They repeated their cycle of disobedience throughout the thousand years that come up from the time of their bringing, being brought out of captivity in Egypt to the time of their going into captivity again in Babylon, which Jeremiah is prophesying. They've gone through the cycle time and time again. They've sinned and God's forgiven them. They've sinned and God's forgiven them. They've suffered and God's brought them back. They've suffered and God's restored them. They've been through that time and time again, but there's a big judgment coming on them in 586 B.C. that Jeremiah is prophesying. Here's one little snippet of all the many things that he had to say in his 52 chapter book. Verse 4, And the Lord has sent to you all his servants the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you've not listened, nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, the prophet said, Repent now, every one of his evil way and his evil doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord has given to you and your fathers forever and ever. Just repent. 
Just change. It's that simple. Just change. And you can dwell in this land, keep this land, for as long as God wants you to have it. Do not go after other gods to serve them and worship them, and do not provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, and I will not harm you. Don't worship these beings that you create out of wood, that you create out of stone, that don't really exist and can't do a thing for you. Don't worship these things that you have to bathe when you could be worshiping me, the one who provides the rain from heaven. Yet, verse 7, you have not listened to me, says the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. To your own pain. They didn't listen to God. And it would cause their own pain. Now it wasn't just the Israelites. But society after society after society. Has done this through the ages. And they break down the family. And they hurt the home. And they go against the commandments that God has given. And it eventually winds up simply destroying. Whole societies and whole bunches of people. People are self-destructive that way. People love the darkness rather than the light that way. But Jesus' love persists. And he still wants to hold out hope for individuals as long as he possibly can. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. And that promise he's talking about in 2 Peter 3, 9 is the end of the world, the final judgment day, the big one, the one which all others have pointed to. The Lord's not slack concerning his promise. That day's going to come. But he's not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want you to go to a devil's hell. He doesn't want me to die spiritually away from him. He doesn't want that for anyone. But the Bible says there he's long-suffering toward us. Not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. He leaves it up to us. One reason the world and Jesus' own people rejected him was simply because of their stubbornness in wanting to follow the darkness rather than the light. Another reason that people reject Jesus is found in the Gospel of John. If you'd like to turn over to John chapter 7 and verse 13. This reason is fear. You can see it in several places. In John chapter 7... Jesus' brothers are kind of mocking him. They don't believe in him. And they tell him up in the northern part of the country in Galilee, if you're really doing such great things, why don't you go down to the capital of Judea, Jerusalem, and show your stuff there? But they're kind of mocking him. Jesus tells them he's not going with them right at that time. But Jesus would go down later. He'd go to the feast and he'd start talking to people among the feast, although he didn't publicly proclaim anything just yet. And about verses 9, 10, 11, and 12, you find out that the people are talking about him. He's the talk of the town. He's the stir of what's going on in Jerusalem at that feast that year. He is being discussed. And some people say, oh, he is wonderful. He is good, verse 12. Other people say, no, no, he's a, he's a liar. He deceives the people. But whatever they were saying, for or against, look at verse 13. No one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. They wouldn't step out of their comfort zone and speak openly about him because, well, the Jews might have something to say about that. The religious leaders might have something to say about that. And there might be some punishment. Well, you wonder what that punishment might be. So, turn over to John chapter 9. And the situation here is that there has been a man who has been born blind that is now of adult being, he has been begging at one particular place that people have seen him and people have known him. Jesus has come by, told him to wash in the pool of Siloam and be cleansed and have his blindness healed. And the man did it. But the religious leaders are angry because Jesus did it on the Sabbath day. So they start an inquiry. They start an investigation. They're going to look into this. And they start questioning people around. They brought in people and talked to them. How do you? They brought the man. Who is this? Who did this to you? But he didn't know quite yet at that point in the story because Jesus had healed him. The man was blind to start with, remember. Jesus had healed them and then slipped into the crowd. So he didn't know first at first. And then they went to the man's parents. Tell us. We, you know, they couldn't deny that everybody knew this man was blind. Everybody could see that he was healed. So they tried to cast some doubt on whether or not he'd been born blind. They said, 
Let's find his parents and ask if he was really born blind. Maybe he's been faking it all these years. So in verse 21, verse 20, they ask his parents, in verse 19, they ask his parents, how does he see? Was he born blind? How does he see? His parents, in verse 20, answered them and said, we know that this is our son. We can confirm that. We know that he was born blind. We got you there. We'll check that box. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age. Ask him. He'll speak for himself. Well, that sounds reasonable till you read the next verse. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was the Christ, he'd be put out of the synagogue. Those people would be shunned. They'd be put out of their religious set setting. They wouldn't have family and friends. If they died, there'd be nobody to attend their funeral. If their kids got married, there'd be nobody to attend their weddings. And they didn't want that so social, social uh, stigma about them. So they lied about Jesus and they threw their son under the bus. Well, you just ask him if he was born blind and if Jesus was the one that healed him. People didn't obey Jesus. People didn't follow Jesus because they were afraid of what would happen to them if they did. We mentioned last week those from John chapter 12 verses 42 and 43 who were even among the religious leaders of the Jews and they believed him but they would not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Now, there are ways that people might suffer in our world all over the place. North Korea, a lot of the Muslim countries in Africa. If you mention the name of Jesus, you're going to be killed, or at least you're going to be tortured and your family prosecuted. Same in China and the same other places. In other parts of the world that are free, they're starting to see a little bit of economic persecution. Companies put policies in place to which Christians can't agree and Christians have to choose between their job or Christ and his principles. A lot of people don't obey Jesus out of fear. I grant you, that's tough. That's hard to swallow. But here's one who gave his life for us. And he doesn't ask us to hurt anybody else. He doesn't ask us to lead this big political movement he doesn't ask us to do all these heinous things that some leaders might ask us to do. He just asks us to give ourselves to him and trust him. I will, ne I will never leave you nor forsake you, he said. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. So we may boldly say, I have my confidence in the Lord. What can man do to me? They might kill me, but I'll go be with the Lord. A lot of people don't obey Jesus out of fear. Don't receive him because they're afraid of the consequences. And then lastly, a lot of people don't obey Jesus, don't accept Jesus out of, now follow me, out of ignorance. I don't necessarily mean that as an insult. You can be ignorant without it being an insulting thing. I'm ignorant of many subjects. I'm ignorant of astrophysics. I'm ignorant of any kind of astronomy. I'm ignorant of a whole lot of fields of study simply because I haven't been exposed to them yet. But it's a tragedy when people allow themselves to not be exposed to the gospel of Christ. And it's a tragedy when Christians who are the people called to the Great Commission who know that there are people out there all over the world and in the community and next door and sitting in the next cubicle that are lost but don't teach them the very things that they need to know to be saved. I can go to heaven without knowing astrophysics and I can go to heaven without knowing meteorology but I can't go to heaven without knowing the salvation that came through Jesus Christ. Some people are ignorant just by circumstance, but then there are other people who are ignorant by will and by choice. Look at John chapter 7 again, if you would. In verses 26 and 27, the people are arguing in that situation at the feast about who Christ is. Verse 26, someone says, look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know that indeed this truly is the Christ? Maybe the rulers are on to this. Maybe they're not attacking him because they know it's the Christ, and they just don't want to admit it yet. But verse 27, watch what they say. Watch carefully. 
think. However, we know where this man is from, the people said at the feast. We know where Jesus is from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. Well, there's their reasoning. Premise number one, we know where Jesus is from. Premise number two, nobody knows where the Christ is from. So, conclusion, this can't be the Christ. But now, watch them in chapter 7, verses 41 and 42. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? They knew where he was from. He was out of Galilee, the northern part, Nazareth, the, the hated country. But then they say in verse 42, same group of people. Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? Now did you catch that? Back in verse 27, the premise of their reasoning is, well nobody knows where the Christ comes from. And we know where he's from so he can't be the Christ. Just a few verses later, in order to keep up their unbelief, they change their tune on both premises without admitting it. We know that Christ is from Galilee, verse 42, verse 26. We don't know, we, we know where this man is from. We know where this man is from. They got that right. But now, verse 26 and 27, they said, nobody knows where the Christ is from. Verse 42, they said, but the Christ, but the scripture said the Christ comes out of Bethlehem. And indeed it did. Micah 5, verse 2 said the Christ would be born in Bethlehem. So they're just being willfully ignorant. And they're using this scripture out of context or this lack of knowledge of scripture out of context to prove their case early in the chapter. And then they're going to that scripture to prove their case later in the chapter. They're being willfully ignorant of the scriptures. They're just not putting it all together. Some people might do that even today. Sometimes there's circumstantial ignorance. I had a friend who a while back got into an argument with atheists through the newspaper columns not social media but through the newspaper columns letter to the letters to the editor they had several rounds back and forth and my friend then was determined he was going to write one last letter if they wrote again well they wrote again and they said we don't want to be the kind of people who give ourselves to the rules and the regulations of a hierarchy that believes in iconography and that sort of thing the way the catholic church does my friend wrote back and said we agree there. I've been preaching against that kind of hierarchy for years because it's not found in the Bible. Do you see what happened? Those atheists were basing their atheism on misinformation. They were basing it on a misrepresentation of what true Christianity was. I also remember a debate where one of our brethren in the Lord's Church debated a Muslim. At the beginning of that debate, I wasn't there, I read the book, at the beginning of that debate, in his introductory remarks, he said, I'm not here to defend any false interpretation of the Bible. I'm not here to represent any misleading interpretation of Christianity. I'm only here to represent what the Bible says, what the New Testament says, and not what men have pretended it said through the thousand years of Catholicism and Protestantism. I'm here to represent New Testament Christianity. It's my understanding that at the end of that debate, that Muslim was converted to the Lord's Church. There was ignorance dispelled. People have been taught to hate Christianity based not on what Christianity is, but what men have made it to be. And those circumstances need to be corrected. They lead people astray. They'll cause people to be lost because of their ignorance. And I don't mean that word there as an insult. But then sometimes there is that willful ignorance that pops up in modern times. Even in the Lord's church in modern times, people want to form Jesus into their own mold. They want to make him into their own image. They want to do, have him do what they want him to do. And so they'll pick out bits and pieces of his statements and not realize that there are other bits and pieces of statements that need to be assimilated into that, that need to be and are harmonizing of one another. People take John chapter 8 where Jesus healed the woman, or not healed, but forgave the woman who was caught in adultery. And they'll take that great phrase that he said, neither do I condemn you. So they'll say then that people can continue in whatever kind of sin that they want and Jesus is not a condemning kind of person. They'll take that along with Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. See, 
Jesus didn't judge people. See, Jesus didn't condemn her. Now, we may struggle with our sin, but there's no reason for us to give it up, they would say. Jesus didn't even tell people to give it up. But they willfully neglect the second part of John 8, verse 11. Go and sin no more. You can't get any plainer than that. You can't dismiss it. You can't argue around it. The only thing that people can do is willfully ignore it. Or they might also ignore John 7 verse 24. Yeah, Jesus said in Matthew 7 verse 1, Judge not that you be not judged. But in John 7 24, He said, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. There's a command to exercise judgment according to the Word of God passage in Matthew 7 goes on to say you just got to be sure you're applying the same standard to yourself before you apply it to other people the passage in John tells us along with John chapter 12 that we're all going to be judged by the standard of the word of God and we're smart enough to know that when people are breaking the word of God they're sinners and they need salvation just like we do with Christ as the one who provides that salvation Christ came from heaven to earth not to live in luxury and not to co-opt palaces and not to co-opt companies and not to bring forth together mergers so that he'd be the most powerful man in the world. Christ came from heaven to earth to be born in the humblest of circumstances, raised in a hated town, raised working manual labor, spent three years of ministry, probably most of the time without a place to lay his head, as he said in Luke chapter 9, to be hated, to be despised, to be crucified. And yet people still don't realize the love that is there. All they see, well, there are rules we don't want to obey. Or all they see is fear of what might happen if I follow him. Or all they see are the willfully misleading tidbits that people feed them. No, Christ loves people. And we ought to replace stubborn... Well, the antidotes to these reasons that people fear him are taught by Christ, emulated by Christ himself. The answer to the recalcitrance, the answer to the stubbornness is the humility that Christ offered through his own personhood and death. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up, James 4 verse 10. The answer to the fear that embodies so many people and causes them to not want to stand up for the morals, the ethics, the principles, the worship practices, the behavior, the plan of salvation that Christ offered, the antidote to all of that is trust. I may not get it, but I know he died for me. And I know he loved me. I know there's a heaven. And I know I want to be there with him. So I'll take his hand like a little child takes the hand of a mother not knowing where he's going, but he trusts that mother. I'll take his hand and he'll lead me where he wants me to go. And the antidote to ignorance is learning. Study to show thyself approved to God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be prepared to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, 1 Peter 3 15. We need to be people of humility, people of trust, people of learning. So that we can avoid the false attacks. Avoid the temptation to anxiety and fear. And avoid the temptation to just be stubborn about fulfilling our wants and lusts. So that we can follow Jesus and someday be in heaven with him. That's what he wants for you. That's what he wants for the world. Now Jesus would go on as recorded by John and as recorded by Matthew, Mark and Luke to die on a cross. He'd go on after three days to be resurrected from the dead quite gloriously. And he would then spend 40 days on the earth being seen by witnesses, ascend to heaven, and 10 days later, his gospel would be preached. The gospel that lasted from then and lasts till now and will last till the Lord comes again in judgment. And that gospel says that if you believe in him, you need to be willing to repent of your sins, confess him, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And that gospel says that you need to be willing to give your life to him with faith and trust and obedience through whatever may come. If you haven't been baptized, we pray that you would be this morning. If you've been walking away from him after once walking with him, oh, come back to him while you still have the opportunity. If we could help you, please come while we stand and sing.